Hello. In this video, we are going to use what we have learned about continuous time Markov chains to develop a probabilistic model for a cube. With this in mind, our learning outcomes are going to be to be able to explain what conditions must be satisfied by the jump rate matrix of a continuous time Markov chain in order for it to have a stationary distribution. We want you to be able to write out the transition graph and jump rate matrix for an MM1 Q with infinite capacity. And we want you to be able to find the stationary distribution for an MM1 Q with infinite capacity. Right, so without further ado, let's consider an example of this business of queuing. In particular, I want you to imagine the queue at the checkout desk in a corner shop. In this corner shop, there is only one checkout desk. That is to say, there is a single server. As such, all customers are forced to pay for their shopping in the same place. Any customer, when they arrive in the shop, is going to arrive, browse the store for a while, picking up items. Then, once they are done, they will join the back of the queue and wait to be served one at a time at the checkout desk. Now clearly, the number of people in the queue at any given time is a random variable, which we are going to assume we can model using a Markov chain. Furthermore, because there is no sense in which we can consider time in terms of a set of discrete jumps, we are going to be forced to use a continuous time Markov chain. The reason for this is that customers can arrive at any time and join the queue, and also because the amount of time each customer takes to get served is going to be a random variable that will depend on what they want to buy. Now my question to you at this stage is can you draw a transition graph for this random variable that measures the number of people in the queue? Pause the video now and have a try. Hopefully, you drew something like this. The reason the graph looks like this is easy to understand. First of all, we place no limit on the number of people that can enter the shop, so the random variable can take any number between 0 and infinity. There are thus an infinite number of states in the chain. At any instant in time, at most one person can join the queue. Furthermore, they go to the back of the queue and thus increase the value of the random variable by 1. Customers, meanwhile, are served one at a time, and so the number of people in the queue can only decrease by 1 in an instant in time. Having worked out the transition graph, let's now try to work out the jump rate matrix. To do so, we need to define the following two limits. The second of these limits gives us information about the rate of change of the transition probabilities for the following connections in the graph. As it turns out, assuming that the rate of change of these transition probabilities is equal to a constant, is equivalent to assuming that the time taken for each customer to get served is given by an exponentially distributed random variable. Furthermore, by assuming that all these elements of Q are the same, we are assuming that the random variable that tells us how long each customer in the shop takes to get served has the same underlying exponential distribution. The second limit here the one about the rate of change of pkk plus 1, tells us about the rate at which the probability a new customer arises changes with time as indicated on the graph. By setting this limit equal to a constant, we are assuming that the customers arrive in the queue according to a Poisson process. This seems eminently reasonable given everything we know about the Poisson process. For reasons we have already mentioned, all the other off-diagonal elements in Q are set equal to zero. This essentially means that people arrive in the Q one by one. That is to say, there are no instances in time when two people arrive. They might arrive extremely close together, though. 
Furthermore, customers are served one at a time because, we, because of the way we set up this matrix queue. Having worked out all the off-diagonal elements of Q, that leaves us only with the on-diagonal elements to work out. These are easy, however, as we can write down the following limit. Furthermore, we can rewrite this single limit as a sum of three limits, namely the limit as delta t tends to zero of one over delta t, the limit as delta t tends to zero of pkk pk k plus 1 of delta t divided by delta t, and the limit as delta t tends to 0 of pk k minus 1 of delta t divided by delta t. Furthermore, we already know what the second two limits are from the bottom of the slide. We thus find that we can write the limit shown here as minus lambda minus mu plus the limit as delta t tends to 0 of 1 over delta t. Inserting these three limits into our expression for Q, we find that the jump rate matrix for the Q is the tridiagonal matrix shown here. Notice that the factors of 1 over delta t in the diagonal terms cancel because we subtract the identity matrix from P of delta t in the limit that defines Q. Furthermore, note that the ellipsis, the dots in this matrix, are used to indicate the fact that the matrix has an infinite number of rows and columns, as the Markov chain has an infinite number of states. This ellipsis thus indicates that the tridiagonal pattern continues throughout the whole of this square matrix. Having determined the jump rate matrix for the Q, we are now in a position to answer two interesting questions about this particular Markov chain. The first of these questions concerns what happens to the length of the queue if on average the length of time between arrivals is less than the time to get served. The answer to this question is intuitively obvious. The queue will on average just grow and grow in length. Customers are arriving faster than they can be served, so unless some other action is taken the queue will grow to progressively longer and longer. If we were to wait an infinite time, the queue would grow to infinite length. A more interesting question concerns what happens if on average the opposite is the case, if the time taken to serve each customer is less than the average into arrival time. To answer this question, we must turn again to the Kolmogorov equation, which we have seen is at the heart of all the things we have done thus far using Markov chains. For finite time Markov chains, we looked at this business of transient and recurrent states, and we learned about the limiting stationary distribution that is adopted by some Markov chains. We now want to ask if continuous time Markov chains can also have a limiting stationary distribution. It turns out that the answer to this question is a resounding yes, as we can see by considering the Kolmogorov equation. The left-hand side of this equation is a derivative of the matrix of probabilities. In other words, it is the rate at which the, all the transition probabilities change with time. If this derivative is zero, then that we can infer that the probability of having a particular transition does not change with time. It thus stands to reason that if the right-hand side of this equation, p of t multiplied by q, is equal to 0, then dp, by d, dp of t by dt is equal to 0, and thus p of t does not change with time. In other words, p of t is stationary. The existence of the stationary distribution for continuous time Markov chains is con commonly expressed using the equation shown here. In this expression, pi is a vector of probabilities and q is the jump rate matrix. The pi here is the stationary distribution. That is to say, pi is a vector that tells us the probability of being in each of the states of the chain. These probabilities do not change with time. 
Let's investigate this business of the stationary distribution a bit further. Let's consider the Poisson process once more and ask if this has a stationary distribution. The answer to this is a clear no. We know that the number of events increases with time and that if we were to observe the Poisson process for an infinite amount of time, the number of events would tend towards infinity. In short, every state in this particular Markov chain, the Poisson process, is transient. If it did have a stationary distribution, however, the stationary distribution pi would satisfy the equation shown here, pi multiplied by q equals zero. Let's see if we can find a vector that satisfies this expression for the Poisson process. Multiplying this row vector by a matrix will give us a second row vector. We can thus determine the vector pi by doing the matrix multiplication on the left-hand side of this equation, by then setting each element of the resulting row vector equal to zero, as is required by the right-hand side of the equation, and by then rearranging to get each of the elements of pi. Notice that here, the matrix that I have written out is the transition probability, is the jump rate matrix, Q, for the Poisson process. The first element of the new row vector we get by multiplying the vector pi by the first column of Q is shown here. When we do this multiplication, we get minus lambda pi 0 equals 0 which in turn implies that pi zero must be equal to zero. We get the second element of the row vector by multiplying the vector pi by the second column of q. This gives us lambda multiplied by pi zero minus lambda multiplied by pi one equals zero. We already know, however, that pi zero equals zero. We thus have minus lambda pi 1 equals 0, and as such, pi 1 must also equal 0. We get the third element of the row vector by multiplying the vector pi by the third column of q. This gives us lambda pi 1 minus lambda pi 2 equals 0. We already know, however, that pi 1 equals 0. We thus have minus lambda pi 2 equals 0, and as such, pi 2 must also equal 0. It turns out that we can make the same derivation for every element of the row vector pi q. In other words, pi must be a vector containing all zeros. Obviously, this is not a valid vector of probabilities. As to be a vector of probabilities, the elements of the vector must sum to 1. The Poisson, Poisson process therefore does not have a stationary distribution in accordance with our intuition. With that digression aside, let's now turn back to the more interesting case of a Q. We will proceed via the same route. That is to say, we will calculate the elements of the row vector pi multiplied by q in terms of the vector pi. We will then set these elements equal to zero and thus solve for the elements of pi. If we do this for the first element of pi q, we get minus lambda multiplied by pi zero plus mu multiplied by pi one equals zero which we can rearrange to give pi 1 is equal to lambda over mu multiplied by pi 0. If we now turn to the second element of pi q, we find this by doing the multiplication shown here. When that finishes, we find the following result, which can be rearranged to give the expression shown on the right-hand side of the slide. Notice that the first term in this second expression is the left-hand side of the expression that we have just determined for pi 1. We can thus replace this term by a plus pi 1, 
and this then cancels with the minus pi 1 in the second term. Rearranging what remains, we find that we can write pi 2 in terms of pi 1. Furthermore, because we already have an expression for pi 1 in terms of pi 0, we can rewrite the right-hand side of the expression we have just obtained in terms of pi 0, as shown here. Let's now turn to the third element of pi q, multiplying the vector pi by the third column of q, we find the following result. This can be rearranged to give the expression shown on the right-hand side of the slide. Furthermore, notice that the th first term here is the left-hand side of the, the expression that we have just determined for pi 2. We can thus replace this term by a pi 2, which then cancels with the minus pi 2 in the second term. Rearranging what remains, we find that we can write pi 3 in terms of pi 2. Furthermore, because we already have an expression for pi 2 in terms of pi 0, we can rewrite the right-hand side of the expression we have obtained in terms of pi 0, as shown here. We see a pattern emerging in the values of pi 1, pi 2 and pi 3. And it turns out that this pattern holds also for pi 4, pi 5 and so on. This pattern tells us that we can write pi n as lambda over mu to the power n multiplied by pi 0. The interesting thing here is that pi n is most definitely not equal to 0. There must, therefore, be a stationary distribution. We do not know what this is yet, however, as we do not know the value of pi 0. It is straightforward to determine this, however. We know, after all, that pi is a vector of probabilities, because pi n is the probability that n people are in the queue. Furthermore, we know that n must be an integer. We therefore know that if we take the following sum over all these probabilities, we must get 1. The number of people in the queue must take an integer value, and our probability vector must be normalised. The pi 0 term in this expression is constant, and it does not depend on the dummy variable in the sum. We can thus take it outside of the summation. We are thus left with the following expression. The summation here is the geometric series, which we all know will converge to a finite value if of 1 over 1 minus lambda divided by mu if lambda divided by mu is less than 1. We can thus write that pi 0 over 1 minus lambda divided by mu must be equal to 1, and therefore infer that pi 0 must equal 1 minus lambda divided by mu. Inserting this value for pi 0 into the expression at the top of the slide, we find that the probability for having n people in the queue is given by the expression shown here. One final word on this derivation is required. Notice that the geometric series here only converges if lambda over mu is less than 1. In other words, lambda, the rate of arrivals, must be less than mu, which, as it turns out, is 1 over the average service time. In other words, the queue only has a stationary distribution if customers are not arriving faster than they can be served, which is in agreement with our intuition. With that duly noted, I will thus finish. You should now be able to explain what conditions must be satisfied by the jump rate matrix of a continuous time Markov chain in order for that Markov chain to have a stationary distribution. You should be able to write out the transition graph and jump rate matrix for an MM1 queue with infinite capacity. And you should be able to find the stationary distribution for an MM1 queue with infinite capacity. As in other videos, there are programming exercises that you can now work through, which should help you to consolidate the understanding you have obtained. In addition, there are written exercises that will take you through the derivation for a queue that is forced to have finite length. Thank you for your attention.